welcome to episode 90. Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and you're listening to Who Did That Voice, where we take an in-depth look at voiceovers. Ready to take a vacay, but you just don't have the time to plan? Let the agents at 3D Travel Company pamper you and take care of all the little details. Find us at www.whodidthatvoice.co and click the Book Now button on the left-hand side. For a limited time, Who Did That Voice listeners can receive a Disney gift card for qualifying Disney and Universal trips, booked and traveled by 2017. Hurry and book today so you can travel away. Welcome to Who Did That Voice, the show where we take an in-depth look at voiceover. And now, here's your host, Trenton Larkin. Hey everyone, just wanted to let you know we have launched a Patreon page. You can find us at www.patreon.com forward slash who did that voice. What is Patreon, you say? Well, it's a lot like a Kickstarter or Indiegogo campaign that allows you to help support us on a monthly basis. For as little as a dollar a month, you can help support the show and earn amazing perks. Help us out today and join the Who Did That Voice family in a new way. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the show. Today, I am super excited to be bringing you another interview with an X-Men. We are speaking with Beast today from X-Men, the animated series. Uh, as you may have heard last episode, this is my absolute favorite rendition of X-Men uh, in the animated form. And these characters from the 92 series were my absolute like start and introduction to the world of Marvel. So I hope you guys enjoy some clips from Beast and the interview to follow. As Archimedes said when he discovered the principle of displacement, Eureka. But the cover looked pretty good. Thomas Wolfe, an old favorite. I thank you. How you doing in here? Stone walls do not a prison make, nor iron bars a cage. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Ah, the joys of marriage are the heaven on earth, life's paradise. The soul's quiet sinews of concord, earthly immortality. John Ford, 1630. Though I am always in haste, I am never in a hurry. John Wesley. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Who Did That Voice? Today, I am super excited to be bringing you an interview with George Buza. George, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, my pleasure. Well, George, it's such an honor to be speaking with you. We're going to dive into some pretty awesome stuff today. But the very first thing I like to do when I have a guest on the show is get to know them. And so who was the young boy, George, growing up into the man he became? And how did he get into acting and more specifically voice acting? Well, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio in the 1950s and uh, just basically went through those years as a, as a little kid playing and uh, going to school. <laughs> and I didn't get involved in any kind of uh, theatrical pursuits until I was in my final year of high school. Oh, wow, okay. And I went to an all-boys school, St. Ignatius in Cleveland, and uh, my girlfriend was going to an all-girls school, Lourd Academy in Cleveland. Oh, wow. And they needed uh, guys to fill out their senior class play. Okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> and nobody was going there to audition or... Uh, well, not, I wouldn't say nobody, but they needed more than what they had show up for the audition. So I got roped into going, and uh, I think as my audition piece, I sang our uh, school song or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. But it was a production of Oliver. Oh, wonderful. And yeah. uh, I snagged the role of Mr. Bumble. Okay. Which is one of the major parts in the play, and... Uh, I found that I enjoyed it so much that uh, my entire senior year, I did nothing but go from one school to the other trying to audition for their plays and participate in productions. Oh, that's awesome. And decided somewhere along the line that this was something I would pursue in university. Yeah. And did so. And uh, went to Baldwin Wallace University. It was college at the time because it was small. It's now been updated to a university. Oh, wow. And during that very same uh, period, uh, John Michael Tebelak, who was the author and producer of uh, Godspell, was also affiliated with Baldwin Wallace. And uh, during the course of my studies there, we had workshops uh, that were done 
with the same company that uh, was producing Godspell in New York. So it was uh, a very exciting time in the uh, late 60s, early 70s to be in that uh, particular genre of avant-garde underground theater. How epic, yeah. That's awesome. And as far as voice acting was concerned, uh, I was doing a production uh, touring play for kids, and uh, one of the actors in the company uh, was doing voiceover work and suggested me to his producer, and I went in and uh, just read a couple of things, and one thing led to the other. Back in those days, it wasn't as difficult to get voice jobs as it is now. Yeah, yeah. In everything, they've they've created more hoops for you to jump through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, George, that's really that's really special. You know, it's it's sometimes the things that we get roped into or uh, you know asked to do that we're not necessarily expecting that we end up falling in love with, and that's really unique to hear how uh, how you got into acting. I love that. It was a total fluke. That's awesome. I never thought that I would enjoy it. I didn't even see a play until my uh, junior year of high school. Oh wow! Well, as far yeah, as I was not, I was more interested in football and uh, yeah, other pursuits. <laughs> I was a member of the debate, and not the debate team, but the speech squad. Okay. Where you okay. You wrote original uh, essays, and then you presented them as a speech, and that was fun. Well, I'm sure so that helped with kind of acting. Performing. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. did. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, you know, and Mr. Bumble isn't he? Wasn't he the the guy at the orphanage? The he main ran guy? the orphanage. You're right. That's what I thought because my father played that role back when he was in high school or college. I think so. That's really, really? cool. Yeah, that's a great yeah. role. When you said that, I was like, I think that's the role my dad told me he played. Yeah, but yeah, it's uh, it's such a unique show. Oliver is is a really good show, and that definitely needs a lot of boys. So uh, if you're in an all girls school, I can imagine. <laughs> Yeah. So, wow. <laughs> you know, they might have wanted to pick something like, you know, Sound of Music or something. It had more females, you know. <laughs> but uh, wow, that's a good show. Well, you know, we're going to dive into uh, the very first project we're really going to talk about, George, is is X-Men, where you played Beast for the 1992 series on Fox Kids. Uh, you know, you worked with amazing people like Cal Dodd, Ron Rubin, Catherine Disher, Lenore Zan, Chris Potter, and Norm Spencer. Uh, what was it like getting to work on that amazing show that has become so iconic, and we're actually celebrating 25 years this year? Well, at the time, it didn't seem as iconic as it does now. Yeah. Uh, it was kind of the infancy of uh, major animation in, in Canada. <laughs> yeah. I originally, the first animation that I, was, I did that was long-term was the, the Ewoks series yes 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 and uh that was kind of like the step through the doorway into animation okay awesome. and then and then we we became a a real uh powerhouse as far as putting out animation was concerned in, in toronto yeah definitely so uh, you just kind of guested from one series to another and if you were lucky enough to get a whole series then you had long-term employment because they usually <laughs> They usually produced enough to do a complete syndication. Yeah, yeah. So you you were doing a five season commitment. Wow. As we did in X Men, that was five seasons. That wasn't just ninety two. That yeah. was yeah. Five years of work. Yeah, which was a great gig. <laughs> it was a terrific gig, and it was yeah. exciting because we are all com uh, pretty familiar with the uh, comic books and everything from our youth. Oh, that's awesome. So. Uh, yeah, it's one of those things that I'm still kicking myself at. Uh, you know, my mother threw out all my old comic books and baseball cards. So. Oh, my <laughs> word. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> very, oh. very sore spot there. You know? Oh, I would totally Don't be sore. Don't leave things at home when you leave. <laughs> <laughs> what, you wanted those, but you left them here? Yeah, no, well, they were just taking up space. And, they know, were worth oh. a fortune. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> you oh, threw wow. away my retirement. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. No, but but that's... then who thinks that stuff that they have as a kid is going to be an antique when they are? Yeah, yeah. Seriously, you know, you, you I never mean, it used know. to be it had to be a hundred years old for it to be worth anything, and <laughs> now with the baby boomers, things from our youth are worth a fortune. Yeah, 
Yeah. And you wish, geez, I had one of those. I wish I didn't throw it away. I wish I didn't break it. <laughs> <laughs> Darn it all. <laughs> wish I still had the original packaging. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? Well, you know, it's great to hear you say that you were actually a comic book reader too, George. And I kind of wanted to ask that, you know, because it's like, you know, sometimes people really have an understanding of the entities that they work on. And sometimes people come into it. Like I know when I talked to Norm Spencer, he was not a comic book reader. So when he got into playing Cyclops for, you know, the X-Men, he he said he had really never been immersed into that world. So for you, it was a little bit different because you were coming into it from a perspective of, hey, I've been reading the comics and kind of an understanding of what we're going into with this project. Yeah, I, was, uh, I bought uh, some X-Men comics. I also bought Superman comics. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, the Supermans are classic. I don't even want to go into it because it's breaking my heart right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Supermans are classic. I mean, you know, some of those are probably worth a, a, a pretty penny today but uh oh know. yeah but they predate me oh yeah yeah well i mean they're they're classic i mean stuff. by the time i had <laughs> enough uh change in my pocket to go buy a comic book which i think at the time was a dime wow <laughs> i think they're worth a little bit more than a dime now george <laughs> i think they are too <laughs> that's that's but there crazy. was also a lot of blowback from the folks because you were supposed to be reading classic literature not <laughs> comic books that's when you're at school with uh you know catcher in the rye and you've got that superman comic in the middle right <laughs> well in high school i had james bond novels in the middle of my book <laughs> nice so uh one good thing with another good thing i like it <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Well, you know, for you playing Beast, you know, he was just so witty and so funny. And, you know, I loved how his hair and Wolverine's hair kind of had the same look. I always kind of felt like they were brothers in, in regards to just kind of some of their style, the way they looked. Uh, growing up as a kid, my first immersion to X-Men was the show that you guys did in 92 and, and for five more years, you know, total. Um, and so I really had never, you know, X-Men and and comics and stuff. I didn't read much as a kid. I had a, a really strong dyslexia disability uh, that I've overcome with time and, and effort. But, you know, so I didn't do a lot of reading. I didn't read comics. And so this was my first immersion into Marvel and X-Men. And, um, you know, and then Spider-Man came out in 94 and you guys kind of crossed over in that series. And so that first immersion on Fox was really my, my whole introduction to Marvel and what I based everything off of. Um, you know, what was it like for you getting to play this witty, smart, funny guy that was always quoting, you know, literature, you know, from Shakespeare and all kinds of other people, Chaucer and people, um, what was it like getting to play this character? Well, it was really uh, an exciting time to be doing that because it was more or less one of the uh, earliest uh, animation series that, that didn't just appeal to small kids. Yeah. Like a lot of the animation is geared to little kids. And so this it was almost like doing an adult uh, cartoon series. Yeah, makes sense. And it was also done in an ensemble setting, so it was very much like uh, radio drama, where the entire cast would read together and you would be doing the scenes as they were written on the page, not just your individual role. Yeah. Most animation is recorded individually, <clears throat> so that you're just in a studio by yourself and you read your lines as if somebody were actually prompting you with dialogue. Yeah. But you're hearing the voices in your own head nobody's reading your cues yeah so you're creating your own drama <laughs> but in this we had the entire cast together for each scene and uh it was just like doing radio drama which uh <laughs> is also a non-existent thing anymore <laughs> you know it, it's not and it's sad because you know radio dramas are something i grew up with as a kid that i absolutely loved and I love when shows like X-Men did Ensemble because I feel like the energy that we get from shows that are, are like that are really more cohesive and they, they bring a lot more energy, I think, to the screen because you can feel that energy from the cast when it's an ensemble. It feels more well, exactly. real. exactly. You feed each other. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when you're doing it by yourself, you're having to pretend on in your own head on how somebody is delivering that line, and you may be wrong Yeah, <laughs> yeah. on how they're going to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's really awesome that you got to uh, to play Beast, George, and you really did shape my world. You know, Beast with you was my first immersion in that character, along with all of your other amazing castmates that played these awesome characters from Wolverine to Morph to, 
Cyclops and Jean Grey and uh, Rogue and all of the others. You know, it was it was my first immersion, and I thank you because. I became a huge Marvel fan as a kid because of this show, and uh, it really shaped my future for being the geek and nerd that I am. So thank you, George. It's all your fault. No. Well, I'm glad we contributed to something. <laughs> yeah, you know, but uh, you guys, you really left a mark, and uh, the legacy that you guys had as a cast has, uh, has been impacting people and is still impacting people to this day because it is a show that people are still raving about because of the quality of the animation, the acting, and just the script writing was just amazing. I mean, they, they had really solid scripts that weren't just, wow, nobody put any effort into the show. They just slapped it together. You know, they really put time and effort into these shows and made them worth their salt today. So, oh, they did. They, they put a lot of effort into putting out a quality product. Yeah, which I admire because sometimes you see stuff today that, like you said, they're more geared for kids. And so you're going wow, they didn't spend much time on this script, you know, <laughs> like, you know, but it's really sad because, you know, there's those of us that grew up with the, the 92 series and sometimes the way the franchises continue, yes, we understand that they're trying to gear it towards kids, but sometimes we get left out and we're going, Hey guys, remember we're still here and we're fans, you know? So, you know, but, uh, you know, some shows try to tailor that to everybody, but some are just geared for young, young kids. And it, it makes it challenging sometimes, you know, when you're a fan. So, George, the next thing I really wanted to talk with you about was Chief Chirpa, who was from Star Wars Ewoks, and uh, you worked with Cree Summer and a lot of other amazing actors. Uh, what was it like getting to work on that series from 1985? Well, that was kind of, kind of like my first real introduction into animation. That was uh, what I would say would be the, the first big break I had in animation. Awesome. Uh, that one we did not ensemble, but individually. So there wasn't the same kind of... Uh, atmosphere as there was on x-men yeah but again we had uh people from lucasfilm who were uh, riding shotgun on it and making sure that everything was uh done according to their specs yeah so that that was also very exciting because of the success of star wars yeah for sure So you felt you were doing something really special <laughs> absolutely and i was a huge fan i mean star wars was one of those movies when you walked out of the theater you went in the wrong direction <laughs> because you were so stunned by what you'd seen yeah and this was i remember back in uh, university when i was taking drama uh history that uh one of the professors there said that you can really tell when you've seen a spectacular play when you're walking in the wrong direction <laughs> when you walk out of the theater and you realize three or four blocks later that the <laughs> Wait, <laughs> this isn't where I live. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. I've never so heard you're that. You're so either. engrossed in what you've seen. And yeah. that, that, that's the way that I felt when I saw the first Star Wars. That was, it just blew me away. Yeah, I bet. And to actually be a part of that when it went to animation was, uh, it was a huge uh, kudos, you know? Yeah. To be able to say that you were a part of that. Well, it's become part of the lore of the whole thing, you know, and it, it, those early animations for Star Wars uh, are very unique, very stylistically uh, different from things that we have, especially in today's world um, of animation. And I, it's just really cool that you were part of that because it was the early days. And I think sometimes the stuff we got from Star Wars in the earlier days, of course, were closer to George Lucas's heart, first and foremost. And, um, you know, he definitely had more of a touch on those compared to what we see nowadays. Not that what we see from Star Wars isn't great, um, but it was just closer to, you know, his heart. And he was the one that actually worked on those directly. So that's really cool that you were a part of that franchise for Star Wars, George. And also, during the period we were doing uh, X-Men, I was doing a live series or a live action series that was also part of Lucasfilm, which was uh, Maniac Mansion. Oh, okay. Maniac uh, Mansion. That was, that was the brainchild of uh, a lot of the people, Eugene Levy and Joe Flaherty from SCTV, where I played a uh, mute, mutated four-year-old kid who had... Uh, his dad was a mad scientist who conducted all these experiments in his basement. And I was chasing a ball and wandered into some sort of chamber that he had. And uh, my uncle ran in there after me and the chamber activated. And I turned out to be this giant four year old kid. And my uncle turned into a fly. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and we did three seasons of that 
which was on the Family Channel. That's funny. But I actually met George Lucas because he came down and uh, brought the original laser swords from Star Wars for our uh, finale episode. No way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. What was it like getting well, to meet? That was quite exciting. Yeah, I mean, I had to be. I mean, did you get a chance to really talk with him, or was it just kind oh, of? Oh yeah, a... we did. We did scenes with him. We we took the piss out of him, really. <laughs> 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 wow. Anybody who came on the show was uh, pretty much subjected to our sense of humor or their sense of humor. Who were the writers? Yeah. We wow. had some uh, pretty high-profile guests. Jose Ferrer. Wow. We had him in. Uh, in fake goat legs. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to check that out because it's not one that I'm familiar with, but it's called... It's not out on DVD. Okay. Maybe it it's on YouTube released. or something. It was, Maybe. It was the property of uh, Family Channel, and they never never uh, marketed it. Interesting. I don't understand why some companies do that, why they don't market their material, but it's called Maniac Mansion, right? Yeah. Okay. I'll definitely have to check that out. And I love when I get surprises, like when I'm not prepared for something, because that's not one I knew of, George. So thank you for uh, enlightening me and, and letting me know about that, because that's really cool that you got to work with George and see the original lightsabers. Uh, did you actually get to hold them? or? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's epic. <laughs> <laughs> Touching a piece of history. Wow. That's awesome, dude. That's way cool. Way well, another cool. link to that was when I was in high school, uh, and just getting into the uh, the theater scene, a guy that went to our high school played the Great White Hope, who is the guy that comes in with a towel over his head at the end of the Great White Hope. Okay. Who had beat Jack Johnson in the uh, in the fight? Okay. James Earl Jones played yeah. Jack Johnson. We got to meet the cast because of the guy who played this bit part, who was in our high school <laughs> on Broadway. That's awesome. So that was my first Broadway play, was Great White Hope, that I had ever seen, <laughs> and got to meet James Earl Jones at the end of the production. Wow. So that was, there was another link there. Yeah, yeah. That I never thought, you know, along the lines would, but it, you know, really stuck in my memory. That was my <laughs> first introduction to Broadway, and yeah, I remember lobbying big time with my parents to be allowed to go, because that was in the 60s, that was the late 60s. yeah. And uh, to be able to, that was my first airplane ride. So there was a lot of firsts. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like it. Well, that's pretty epic, George, for sure. Well, you know, when you speak about people that you've known that kind of were involved with something else, uh, when I went to high school, I actually went to school with Lindsey Prowse, who was the uh, niece, I believe, of David Prowse, who played Darth Vader in the costume for Star Wars. So ah. um, going to school with her was kind of like, wow, that's epic, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, she was a pretty young lady, and she actually was in our theater group. So she, uh, I was in Music Man my senior year. Uh, and I was the mayor, and she was Marion, the the librarian. So uh, that was really epic, getting to act with her in a in a production that was done on a very high scale. I was in a private school. I'd gotten drafted my senior year for my acting abilities from a local community high school to a private school my senior year for my acting. So that was really, really fun. And uh, just the fact that she was going to that school and I got to work with her on that show was like, pretty epic because it kind of made me feel like I was connected to Star Wars in some way or another. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's wild how life brings our, uh, our life to connection of things that we love, you know, sometimes. So, well, George, you've gotten to work on three different video games for sure, where you've played uh, a variation of different characters. One of them, you played beast. One of them, you played just Colossus, but the one that you played the most on was called X-Men children of the atom. It came out in 1994 and you actually got to voice Colossus, Magneto, Omega red and juggernaut on that one. Do you remember working on those video games? No, <laughs> <laughs> I hate to say it vaguely, but again, those were done in a very short period of time. I think you went in on for one day yeah. and did everything or maybe two days, but I don't really 
recall it as clearly as I do the sessions for the cartoon series. Well, that's understandable. It was a lot shorter time period, but you know, it's really cool that you actually got to voice all these other X Men. You know, uh, some on the on the good side, some on the bad side, some kind of neutral. Uh, but you know, it's really cool that you got to voice all these different characters uh, for the X Men franchise, and not just Beast. But Beast is by far my favorite voice that you've done. Uh, in fact, one of the video games you did where you voiced Beast came out in I believe 2000 or 2001. Uh, so you. You've done something, you know, almost 10 years down the line from when the show was uh, done, which was really cool that you got to come back and play Beast again all those years later. Well, I don't think they brought us back to play Beast again. I think what they did was uh, collected old uh, uh, voice clips, maybe. Really? Okay. I'm not really sure. See, again, I don't remember going in for any sessions in 2000 or then for X-Men. Okay. But, you know, memory fails the old, so <laughs> <laughs> things that were very short uh, sessions, I'm not necessarily uh, that cognizant of anymore. Yeah, I understand. Well, that's okay. You know, that's totally Like when fun. you do video games, very few of them, at least at that time, were long sessions. Like now, they put a lot more into them. Yeah. Like I just uh, did a video game, I don't even know the name of it. Uh, but they were long sessions, and you did a whole battery of of different responses and words and things that would be that they don't even really make sense to you. Yeah. But in the context of the game, there are these interactive games. Yeah. So they're very vastly different than what they were back then. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they've definitely expanded the dialogue, expanded the stories, and uh, you know, people want it to be more of a episodic kind of thing when they're playing versus just you know basic fight words or whatever you know like some of the older games were where it was just very minimalistic and stuff you know no the last video game i played was super mario <laughs> that's a classic but that's uh, that's been a, a wee bit back there george <laughs> no kidding like <laughs> it came out in 85 so you know yeah. which was when you were doing uh you know the chief chirpa for star wars ewoks that's so. right it's been a, a going wee to bit. video arcades and playing uh space invaders oh goodness gracious <laughs> left a few rolls of quarters in that game i bet <laughs> You know, that's awesome. You know, going to old arcades, I love it. You know, when you could find an old arcade and go and play some of the classic games, that's that's always a lot of fun, too, for sure. Well, back then, they weren't uh, old arcades. They were current arcades, and there were lots of them. Well, I'm talking about my childhood, George. Yeah. <laughs> well, this you wasn't know, even but... childhood. This was in my 30s. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Late 20s. So it's kind of like Tron. We had a video arcade not far from our house, and you know, we got bored and nothing on TV. We'd go play video games for a while. You know, and they really don't have arcades like they used to. I feel like when, you know, back in the 80s and 90s and stuff, maybe 70s too, you know, they had a lot more arcades. Uh, and today, it's like very limited where you can actually find places to go play games like that anymore. You know, but well, I guess maybe that's because everyone has one in their home. find a video store anymore. Yeah, no kidding. Well, I mean, because everyone has a... Or... Yeah, online, or you buy it. <laughs> True, but there's no more place to go rent a movie. Yeah, well, and everyone has a video game system in their house now, practically. So why why go anywhere, right? <laughs> well, to rent it is is as much as it used to be. To to buy it now is as much as it used to be to rent it. Yeah, yeah. Everywhere you go, they got these bins for five bucks. Which oh, there's one of my movies. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, end up in the bargain bins at some point. Yeah, no kidding. Well, George, do you remember working on Beyblade back in two thousand two? Oh yeah. Yeah, awesome. that I do remember. Awesome. Well, you played Grandpa on that one, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah, Kung Fu Grandpa. <laughs> Kung Fu Grandpa. What was it like getting to work <laughs> on that show? Because that's one that I actually really loved. And my brothers, actually, I integrated them. When they watched that show with me, they were, you know, five and seven, I think. And they ended up watching Beyblade with me, fell in love with it. And now my brothers are like hardcore anime lovers because of that show. Well, that was a lot of fun to do. I mean, that was kind of like being Kato and the Green Hornet. Yeah, yeah. You know, because Grandpa would suddenly show up unexpectedly and uh, uh, <laughs> force his grandson to <laughs> do a bunch of martial arts in the middle of something else. Yeah, <laughs> like, whoa, why are you here, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you was quite funny, and uh, it was fun. I didn't realize that was you until I was doing my research, and I was like, "No freaking way, that's George." So uh, that was really cool uh, for me to learn because Beyblade was a really cool show. So, 
Well, that's still around. It is. They it's did still another very version of that again. Yeah. And they still sell the Beyblades. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. It, it's it's spawned kind of like Pokemon. It's it's had several renditions where they've kind of yeah. evolved it and stuff. You know, Beyblade, whatever. You know, XT or whatever they call it. But there's been several different versions since the original. What? But you were part of that legacy too, that spawned off a whole yep, other. Yeah, the chain very of first shows, one. So, yeah, which is really cool. Um, well, George, it's been so awesome talking with you today. I've got two more questions and we will wrap this interview up. And the first of the two is what kind of advice would you give to somebody who's, uh, looking at joining this world of acting? Well, that's a difficult question because it is a very, very hard road. Yeah. And I used to do, uh, these, uh, professional career days and in, in high schools where you would go and try and enlighten the uh, students as to what would lay ahead if they chose your path. Yeah. And I kind of laid out a very bleak outlook because it is so difficult and there is so much letdown and rejection involved in choosing that path that you really have to steel yourself against it. Now, I remember when I was an apprentice actor and we were having a, uh, a session with the, uh, <clears throat> one of the professional actors in the, uh, like union actors in the company who was giving us the same type of uh, career advice. And yeah. he said, you know, you can't take the rejection personally. He said, when you don't get the part, you just have to tell yourself that they weren't looking for me. And, if, you know, now when you're a senior citizen, you're going up for certain roles that you used to play when you were in your 40s and 50s. <laughs> you think, geez, I'm, I'm too old for this, you know. But they still give you an audition because they're being gracious. Yeah. And, you know, you're getting that same rejection you used to get when you were a novice actor. And, but now you figure, I do take it personally. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you really have to have a tough skin. Yeah, tough skin. And you have to have a lot of uh, dedication. <clears throat> and I also used to tell the kids that you have to develop as many skills as you possibly can. Yeah. Because you never know what you're going to be asked to do. And the other thing is you don't lie about what you can do. Because <laughs> <laughs> you'll be bound to do that. <laughs> well, because they will expect you to go out there and do it with some proficiency, you know, yeah. like riding a motorcycle or riding a horse. And you know, possibly riding a motorcycle would be easier because you have more control over it than you would do with an animal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I realize that because I never lied about being able to ride a horse, but they still forced me to do it. That's funny. <laughs> and... uh Neither one of us were happy. Not the horse, <laughs> not me. <laughs> that is funny, George. But stick to itiveness. You know, the you really need the dedication, and you also have to have a realistic approach. That if it doesn't happen for you, you don't sit there for forty years waiting tables, thinking, "Well, tomorrow will be my next break." <laughs> you have to kind of give yourself a timeline that if things don't happen by a certain point, you got to find something else to do. Yeah. And even my folks used to say, get yourself a backup plan, which I never did. <laughs> uh, but then uh, I never really needed it because I pretty much coasted from one gig to the other my entire career until I became a senior, at which point a lot of times they don't watch anymore. Yeah. You know, there's, they're not writing parts anymore for the older actors and even the, the big stars who have reached their senior years, they're producing their own stuff. Yeah. Just to get any work. And this is why you get, you know, movies like The Replaceables and, you know, they're old action actors who are old. Yeah. <laughs> so they've got to do their own stuff so they can still keep doing it, like Steven Seagal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I yeah. got new hair. I got new hair and I can still fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I've seen, you know, I've noticed that, you know, as a kid growing up, I, you know, you start seeing actors that just start producing a ton and they don't necessarily act as much. And I always kind of wondered about that, but it's kind of like they've gone out of the point when people really want to see them as much or I don't know, you know, and, and then you start seeing them produce a ton of stuff. But, um, you know, it's well, this business pigeonholes you more than you, you realize. And once you've done two or three things in a row that are similar, that's the way they will view you. So as soon yeah. as you try and break out of that, they go, oh, no, no, he's, he's a fight guy. He's an action guy. Yeah. The transition to being a kindly old grandfather after you've been the bad guy for 40 years, <laughs> that's the way people see you. Because there's 
so much identification from what your past glories were to what you are today. Yeah. That eventually they just uh, say, well, you know, he was great in his day, but now, you know, let's move on. Yeah. Let's get somebody like him. There's an old actor joke about, you know, it it ends up, let's get somebody like him. (laughs) (laughs) You remember that one guy? (laughs) Yeah. 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 I want want him, but 20 years younger. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's crazy, but it's true and it's understandable. But, uh, you know, and, and the funny thing is with being an actor, you should be able to uh, be more versatile, but sometimes, like you said, once people see you as something in particular, you're kind of stuck in that based on what other people think, not based well, on the ability you is have. Well, versatility is not a subjective thing, Yeah, because you're dealing with something very objective, and that's yeah. your body. You know, that's your tool. You know, a mechanic, he can be any age. As long as he can lift a wrench, he can still work on a car. Yeah. But an actor, if you've established yourself as an action actor or you know, there comes a point where you can't even stand on your feet for a 16 hour day, Yeah. let alone do fight scenes with any kind of credibility. Yeah. Which is just part of life, you know? So that's part of life. <laughs> you get older, you get slower, you get arthritis and, uh, <laughs> and you just don't have that kick. And move you just like don't you have to. it anymore. I mean, I used to play bikers up and down the, the, the road here, the countless biker movies. Yeah. But all the bikers now they're not in their sixties yeah. or seventies. They're, even though the poor old guy that they had on uh, Sons of Anarchy that walked around with the oxygen pack. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, George, you know, you were speaking about bikers in bars, and it made me think of a role that you played actually in the original X-Men movie that came out in 2000, Brian Singer's film. What role did you play in that? Well, I played a trucker who picked up uh, Anna Paquin, who played Rogue, and delivered her to this truck stop uh, arena where Wolverine was doing his cage fighting. And that was another case of uh, I had gone into audition because there were small parts that were available in that movie. And uh, when I went to read, uh, Brian Singer was at the table uh, listening to the auditions, and uh, they mentioned that I had been Beast in uh, X-Men. Yeah. And so they gave me this small part as the trucker, so that I could be in the movie, and they said that they were very grateful for the work that we had done on the cartoon series, because without that, that movie probably would not have been made. Wow. So that was a, uh, you know, it was really exciting to be a part of that, and to to have a very short scene with Anna, and a short scene with uh, Wolverine. Yeah. Well, that's really pretty cool. (laughs) Even yeah, though it was all these a small part. with greatness, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand. Well, that's really cool that you were a part of it. Um, you know, I, I actually was re-watching it the other day, uh, X-Men, just to kind of, um, you know, refresh my memory on it. Because you had mentioned something about being on it when we talked prior to the interview and everything. And so I was like, oh my gosh, I, I totally f- didn't realize that. And when I went and researched it, I was like, sure enough, there he is. I was like, that's awesome. It was so epic. Well, George, the very last question I have for you today is, what is the legacy that you want to leave behind? Well, just that I brought some entertainment to people, that I was able to uh, bring them some enjoyment and, uh, you know, nothing really dramatic or spectacular, but that uh, the work that I'd done over the years would not be something that people would easily forget and that they would look upon it as something that would amuse them, you know, throughout the years. Yeah. I love it. I love that, George. Well, you know, simple is sometimes the best, you know, and it's, it's like you said, nothing lavish, but it's just hoping that you brought some joy and happiness to other people. I think that's amazing. Well, that's all I ever asked when I was watching my own, not my films that I was in, but other films, you know, is, yeah. you know, for these two hours, let me be totally immersed in this piece of entertainment and, uh, walk away with a little bit either of, uh, of more knowledge or, just uh, some happy memories from what I just seen. Absolutely. I love it. Well, George, it's been an absolute honor and pleasure having you on the show today. Would you give us a close out today as Beast? There's no real words of wisdom that I can impart. Beast was one of those wonderful, wonderful roles that uh, I will take with me for the rest of my life. And I'm actually looking at uh, two cells from the, uh, the series right now in my office. And they always bring me back the uh, the fond memories of that uh, series. 
Hey, George, thanks so much. I really appreciate your time, and uh, this was a blast to get to talk with you. Well, thanks for bringing back some old memories. And this is George Boozes saying goodbye on Who Did That Voice? Well, everyone, I sure hope you enjoyed today's interview with George Booza, the voice of Beast from X-Men, the animated series. And if you did, please find me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram by searching Who Did That Voice? I would love to hear from you. You know, a question you might ask yourself is, where can I listen to Who Did That Voice? That's an excellent question. You can hear us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, TuneIn Radio, YouTube, and our website at www.whodidthatvoice.co. Click the Episodes tab and listen away. Well, everyone, that's all the time we have for this episode. Join us next time for our special guest, Cal Dodd, the voice of Wolverine from X-Men the Animated Series. You won't want to miss this episode. Hey, do you ask yourself who did that voice? Well, if you do, go to our website, www.whodidthatvoice.co, and click on the Episodes tab. Choose an actor, pick their name, and see pictures from the different characters they voiced in their career. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time for more discoveries on Who Did That Voice.